When Marissa said, maybe we should see other people, Nicholas decided to give her cancer. Nicholas, like many geniuses, had his great obsession. The root of his monomania wasn't hard to trace. After all, he had lost both his parents to cancer at the age of 13. He bore mute witness as they wasted away, licking Michelinus fluids onto crisp white hospital sheets. Colon cancer father and lung cancer mother had followed in quick succession. Outwardly, he remained static. Inwardly, he was a royal of emotion. First, debil debilitating grief. Then rage at his parents for abandoning him, followed by searing guilt, guilt at surviving, guilt at doing nothing to save his parents. Certainly, he'd been young when it happened, not even of legal age. Still, he suffered lingering doubts that if only he'd asked the right questions instead of insisting on different doctors or course of treatment, spoke out for his parents, then they'd be able. Things might have gone differently. For years, he prayed that cancer would take him too. Seven months ago, he watched his mother's casket roll into the ground alongside his father. And one week after he turned 13, Nicholas matriculated at Harvard. By the age of 16, he graduated summa cum laude with a degree in biology. At 25, he had already published half a dozen groundbreaking studies. He was a full professor at his alma mater and an MD. His goal was nothing less than the holy grail of cancer research, the, a magic bullet to cure cancer. All cancers. By 28, frustrated with his incessant struggle in funding and boredom distractions of teaching, he left the academy for full time research in a, a corporate lab. Twelve years he told at Recombia, insisting on working alone. Skirted by colleagues made uncomfortable by his brooding intensity, he didn't care that he must look a freak to them. Tall and thin, a long sad face, stooped shoulders, skin shallow, sallow from the fluorescent light of the lab. More than once he'd been likened to John Carradine, the perennial. B movie mad scientist. Yet he did nothing to dispel his image, favoring somber garb to the dark stubble of almost beards while sectioning cancerous mammals and with precise strokes of the scalpel. But he was tolerated, venerated even, by the corporate board. His work had produced several lucrative patients. They gave him things he needed and left him alone. In the some, same way cancer had relentlessly consumed his parents' vital organs, so it consumed his imagination. Day after day in the lab, and during endless sheet-twisting nights in his Spartan bare-walled apartment, until Marissa happened into his life, that is. Even obsessed geniuses can fall in love. The IRS sent Marissa to audit him. He never having filed a return, nor answering, nor answering any of their letters. She waited for him outside his apartment into the wee hours of the morning until he dragged himself home from work. She startled him, looking out of the darkness, spectral, Pale as a gibbous moon, the oval of her lovely, pretenderous, natural face, framed in white hair, 
but almost startled, startling of all were her eyes, deep red pupils, like those of a photo slash frozen cat, surrounded by milky blue irises, be which Nicholas couldn't look away. Marissa was a breathtakingly beautiful albino. She wore a perfectly tailored black suit with a shocking contrast of her unpigmented skin and argentine hair. The red garnet pin in her lap glowed with the same eerie light as her eyes. You've been a bad boy, she said, and that was all took for Nicholas to fall terminally in love. An audit can be sim can be a simple thing if one gives good records or if the records are spotty. It can take a long time, require an auditor or auditee to spend many hours hurled head to head weaving together an intimate details of one's financial life. Nicholas' case was the latter. Not only had his parents come for money, carrying with them all the attended stocks, bonds, and sun-dry other investments he'd inherited and then ignored, but the generous royalty contract he'd negotiated with his biotech firm had netted him a small fortune. Now that three of the drugs he developed were fairly burned up the market, burning up the market. His tax liability, penalties included, was substantial. Seven figures was her guess. A prolonged audit would be necessary. Nicholas was elated. Over the course of the next few weeks, he spent less and less time at the lab and more and more at his apartment with Marissa. Shifting through his financial records, slowly exposing his empty life through the an audit trail. Within days, cancer had been displaced in all his waking thoughts by her. When she wasn't around, he suffered the pangs of nascent love. The sleepless nights of torturous days waiting for her to reappear. To prolong the audit, he lost some of the critical paperwork purposely misreported on other forms. She was unfazed. They ordered pizza as he as they tried to make sense of the statements and earnings and losses. Tipped expressos at the local donut shop as they sorted receipts. When it turned out he was nominal president of three numbered corporations and that his net worth had been worth was in tens of millions he shrugged. Marissa was clearly puzzled by his reaction at his indifferent of his own wealth. Still, she seemed to warm to him, took to calling him by his first name, and touched his arm lightly when she discovered something of interest in the sea of documents. One day, they even took boxes of pay stubs to, di to dinner at her favorite restaurant, an intimate Turkish cafe. It was here, after a meal, that she jokingly suggested he might add to his paltry deductions to marry her and have a child. Marriage, a child, with Marissa. His heart soared. Weeks passed before the first kiss, weeks in which Nicholas fretted endlessly about her feelings, re replayed their encounters over and over again in his mind, trying to gotch her reactions and his clumsy advances. Marissa, beautiful, delicate Marissa. When the last I was dotted and the last T crossed on his final return, they kissed. For the first time, cancer seemed unimportant. Maybe we should see other people. Marissa's words jolted Nicholas out of his body. He floated above them, the vacated shell of his f physical self, still in bed next to her, frozen in rejection, his glistening 
erection, not yet subsided, withering instantly. Twice before, he'd experienced his out-of-body phenomenon both times with the same stoop uncloseness had explained his parents' cancers had metastasized. Things aren't working out the way I'd hoped, Marissa said to the shadows of the bedroom. Nicholas collapsed back into his body. Every molecule of his being wanted to scream, No! You're wrong! But he remained tight-lipped, as self-contained as he had been at the side of his parents' hospital beds. I don't think you're ready for this level of commitment. How could she say that? Of course he was ready. Tonight he had planned on telling her he loved her. That he wanted to be with her forever. Too late for that now. Unless, reaching out, he put his hands on her breast, tracing its shape the way he li- she liked it. Don't. But her sharp intake of breath belied her admonition. Nicholas feathered the back of his hand down to her belly, felt tiny invisible hairs rise to meet his knuckles. As soft as a breeze, his hand slid between her legs, his long and his figure straightened up into the miraculous warmth. No! Marissa disclined, distangled herself and rose, looming naked in the moonlight, her skin flawless as the finest English porcelain, heart stoppingly beauty, the contrast in Nicholas' imagination to his own scrawny conservative form. Of course she wanted to see other men, younger, better looking men, men she could love with the way she, he loved her. He pulled the sheets up to his chin, ashamed of his pitiful carcass. You're dumping me. Don't say it like that, Nicholas. His genius utterly failed him. She was slipping away while all he could do was stupidly clutch the edge of his sheets. You know I want children. She looked away. I'm sorry, but I don't think you're ready. So that's what this was about. You're wrong. Look, Nicholas, you're a nice guy, but there's an anger inside you that scares me. It's poisoning our relationship. I can barely cope. So how can could I have a child deal with it? Anger. Nicholas was taken aback. I don't know what you're talking about. You can't bring your parents back, she said sharply, as if she were annoying at him for forcing her to explain. Not by being with me or by having your own child. Marissa pulled on her panties and absent of cha of black against her ablaster skin, slid her arms through the straps of her bra, its dark lines descending her breasts. I've got to get going. Her tone softened, became conniculatory. We'll talk about it later. When we're calmer. Next week, okay? He had nothing to say. Too fast, too fast. She'd gather up her things and was gone, leaving Nicholas in the dark. A ghostly afterimage of her naked luminescent sperm indefinitely into his comas. He felt abandoned, lost, as much as he had that day. He stood alone over the twin graves of his parents. That was when he knew he had to give her cancer. The essence of his plan was simple. He'd save her, and she'd love him. How to do it? Three years ago, he'd worked on the clandestine project funded by the CIA. The agency had requested an undetectable delivery system for aggressive cancers using emicillated virus factors a kind of delirious gene therapy. Nicholas pulled up the old files to cancer he selected and accelerated her accelerable 
unprecedented cancer cancer was one he'd fathered in his lab. He knew its cell surface proteins as intimately as he knew as he would have known the face of his own child. And so knew its weaknesses too. In his experiments, he found that he could vanquish them, malignant neoplasm easily, working miraculous recoveries and chimpanzees languish, languishing in the latter stages of the disease. He also knew conversional therapies would be useless in fighting this, his variant. It was ideal. The only problem was a liquid suspension system, too dark, too viscid, and with a sharp, funky aftertaste that made it useless to the CIA. But Marissa loved the thick, brackish coffee served at the turkey's place. Nicholas was right in believing that the murky liquid was one of the few substances likely to mask the taste, smell, and appearance of this acrid carcinetic goo. A tiny squeeze, squeeze too in his pocket, an opportune, opportune moment when she excused herself to go to the toilet. Nicholas picked up the silver, made a teaspoon, stirred, waited for the liquid diffuse in Mexico. Once it returned to Lucerne, her seat, she looked at Wally, Nicholas frowned, then realized he was still stirring her coffee. Sorry, said, dropping the spoon. She looked at her cup, then at him. Are you all right? Sweat trickled down his temple. Fine. His stomach nodded until now. He'd been so focused on preparing his cancer, he hadn't had time to experience out. Now he looked at her, at, Mar- at beautiful Marissa. What the hell was he doing? Reaching for her cup. He curled his fingers around it. That one's probably cold. I'll order you another. She grabbed his wrist. Nicholas felt his own quickened and pulse breathing beneath her pale fingers. No, it's fine. I have to be going. Going? But we haven't really talked. I'm not sure there's a lot more to say. She looked away out the window. Besides, she said, far too casually, while letting go of his wrist. I really do have to be going. Another case. Another case? Another late night audit? Like his? Nicholas felt nauseous. He let go of the cup. Marissa picked it up and put put it to her lips. Nicholas watched her drink. She dropped her share of the bill on the table and, with a cast pink on Nicholas' cheek, was gone. Six weeks later, she called him for the cancer ward. Ask any researcher as good as a chimp is for modeling a human being. A chimp is not a human being. So it shouldn't have been a complete surprise to Nicholas when things went away. Amidst the monitor ping and the drip of the IV, he hovered over her hospital bed, devastated. Mercy's fingers clutched weakly at his. She looked deceptively normal, but inside things were gone. Very wrong. Unlike the lab experiments, Mercy's cancer had metastabilized. Metasized, slip into other organs where it hasn't supposed to be gone. It spread with a single minded virulence that befuddled the doctors at the hospital. In a matter of weeks, Marissa's poor body had not only been assaulted by cancer, cancer but had been besieged with an inexplicable spate of other cancers afflicting her colon, lungs, and throat. Nicholas' miraculous cure aimed at only one target, 
the band series. In that respect, the experimental drug he proved the doctors had worked exceptionally well. They were singularly impressed with the results, but as for the other cancers, they gave her four months tops. Nicholas stared at Marissa's beautiful sad face. She would abandon him as his parents had, and for all his genius, there wasn't a damn thing he could do about it. Or was there? Fused troblast, trophoblast. He made it the proposal to the board several years ago. His notion was to fight cancer with an equally aggressive vector, embryonic cells, or more specifically, trophoblasts. Cultivated from embryonic cells, after all, the embryo struggled to bury itself in its mother's uterus, was veiled only by the sound of a malignant cancer or normal tissue. This PowerPoint animated showing the engineer cells, his black magic bolts dispersed and grew throughout the body like a swarm of angry bees, targeting, targeting magnetic low growths, then hijacking critical blood for their own voracious appetite, starving out the maglets. Once his host died, the engineer trophoblast cells would starve too. On Nicholas' screen, bright triangle and tumor cells crumbled under the onslaught, disappearing altogether. Complete remission in days, a cathodome of all cancers in a single syringe. A convincing presentation, he thought. Unfortunately, the board hadn't found it so. Rather, they found it unpalatable. Developing bioweapons for the CIA was one thing. Creating human embryos from which to harvest cells was another. Support for the project was roundly rejected, thus making it impossible for Nicholas to obtain the embryonic materials he needed for his experiments. He moved on. Only now, his magic bullet was Marissa's last hope. She simply had too many tumors. Too many targets, even if he stole all the experimental drugs he and his colleagues had ever produced, to pump her full of them. So Nicholas made a copy of the necessary file, snapped the lids onto several petri dishes, and stuffed everything into his briefcase. Then he tendered his resignation. The next day, he rented a vacant butcher shop and spent a significant amount of his liquid, of his liquid acid equipping it. The place was in the middle of the industrial neighborhood, surrounded by decaying warehouses on three sides and a rail yard on the fourth. Painting over the windows, he worked for, feverishly converting the shop into a part lab, part operating theater. He installed everything necessary for blood work and biopsies, then put together an imagining century of sorts, including an ultrasound and use extra unit. Against one wall he placed a rack of a dozen rack cages, against the other he put two blue plastic lined bins for animal waste. He used the animals to perform toxicity and side effect tests, at least whatever time would allow her. Long after visiting hours ended, the corridor was silent, save for the occasional nightmare-inspired moan of distant submarine cough. You'd see Nicholas sit past the sleepy duty nurses and crept into a nurse's dark room. Her eyes were closed and her chest rose and fell with a wheezing irregularity. It had been a week since his last visit. He'd been busy prepping his lab and getting the first series of live animal experiments. And her condition had so deteriorated Nicholas's shock into momentary inaction. She looked hollowed out. Her cheeks sunk into her eyes, dark bruises, her long, gorgeous hair all but gone from the futile regimen and radiation of chemotherapy. Nicholas picked up her hand. It was looking damp, like holding a drowned kitten. She stared and moaned softly. Her eyes fluttered open, startling him. 
her red pupils were dilated. Nicholas? I'm here. Why? She floated groggily into a sea of painkillers. He stroked her forehead gently. Why what, Melissa? Why did you do this to me? Nichols taken a pack. Did she know? He ne she never mentioned it to any of his previous visits. Or was she just delirious, taking, talking about something else? An errant memory swimming through the Nicholas. He searched her first, but couldn't tell. She swallowed and closed her eyes in a moment of her breathing slowed and also shallow became regular. Because I love you, Nicholas said, kissing lightly on the forehead. He carefully detached the IV drips, sliding the needles from her victim skin, dripping bright red lines from her thin arms. Peeling back the tape, Nicholas removed two catheters cradling her like a newborn. He lifted and placed her in a wheelchair he brought. He made for the elevator, passing the now empty nurse station and down the street level. He rolled her through the emergency room past incurious dazed eyes, looked at her own pain, lost in their own pain, and out in his waiting van. Please, Nicholas, let me die. Marissa's voice was raspy. It was the first time she'd address him directly in a week. Usually, when she spoke, it was to phantoms. Occasionally, she sang snatches of her children's songs. But for the last hour, she followed his moments of a boom to where she'd stop into the girl, repeating her plea like a mantra. Nicholas increased her morphine dose to milligrams. Please. She started again, then shut her, collapsing into absurd silence. Nicholas felt a, sh a sharp pang of guilt. She hadn't really needed the analyst stick, but his nerves were raw, and now, of all times, it was critical that he was able to concentrate. For three weeks, he worked on culturing trophoblasts blasts from Marissa's eggs and his sperm. Of all of the dozen of cultures he'd started, only one cell line was still viable. Nicholas filled the syringe with half the murky liquid fluid in which her final hope swam, slid it into the vein of her arm, and thumped the plunger, firing the magic bolts into at the targets. Marissa railed and Nicholas allowed himself the faint hope. In the days of following, her tremors began to shrink. In the next two weeks, her progress was astonishing. Her recovery seemed a certainty. Nicholas was joyous. Then her emission came to a crashing halt. Her tremors began reasserting themselves. Nicholas applied a second course for treatment. He used up the last of his engineered cells. Only this time, her rally lasted for no more than 48 hours. The cancer made up of its temporary abandonment was a deadly new infancy. Fresh lyomats, chronicles, and maylomas appeared. Bumps developed on her breast and uterus. Her left iris flecked with the black spots crest of melanoma, and her eye and her nose developed uterus sores. Her beautiful, long, pristine skin slowly receded under masses of brown lesions and red-purple nodules of capsis saccharoma. So Virgil's cancer ravaged her throat, reducing her cry to an unrecognizable, rasping voice. Then an x-ray revealed the dark spots of several glomas in her brain tissue. Nichols finally understood her cancer. Little organs were beyond even his power of redemption. In days, perhaps hours, Marissa would succumb. He'd lost again. Six weeks to a day after he'd brought her here, exhausted and filled with desperation, desperate anguish, he pulled her off life support and laid next to her in the gurney and wept. Despite his belief that she 
he was feeding the cancers more than her. Nicholas kept her IVs attached. He couldn't bear to starve her to death. He loved her too much for that. So she lingered another day, and then the next, for a whole week. But how? For two long weeks, the cancers continued their rampage. She barely looked too, and there wasn't a single centimeter of her ivory skin left, although she was still vaguely Marissa shaped. She was a mass of lesions, waxy brown lumps of and separated tumors. Her left eye was dark with clotted blood. It swelled and crisped over, forcing her lid perpetually open. Nicholas leaned over to examine the brown distant globe. He touched it with the tip of his latex clad finger and it popped. Spat spattered his cheek in his yellowish white pus. How could she be alive? Nicholas had a clue. Unless a snatch of conversation he'd once had with Marissa came back to him. One of the few times he talked to her about his work. Isn't cancer caused by mutation? She asked. He'd his answer. He'd answer it in an affirmative. And isn't that how new species evolve? He conceded the point. So maybe cancer is a new form of life struggling to express itself. At the time, we tried to explain the naivety of her point, but now Nicholas wondered if he hadn't been a na naive one. Another week passed. Nicholas' lab filled with the stench of death and the bacterial products of decay. High might protestine and caverine, but instead of killing her, the tumors combated her organs and stabilized them, creating dark clotted doppelgangers. The smell diminished, new growth popped up, and can the cancer somehow activated long dormant sequences of DNA. Strange mishap in organs proliferated inside her abdominal walls and thoracic cavity. They pulsed with life and dark fluids, passed along and through them, sustaining her. Her blood starved skin cracked and peeled, then sold off her broad swatches, revealing brown carpuses beneath. Where her mouth had been was a blistered oval. Something that might have been a tongue twisted in its depths. Two brown, furious orbs had replaced her albinic eyes, twitching in dark sockets, mimicking the movement of realized. But did they see anything? Nicholas had no way of knowing. Marissa was alive. He stared at her, incredulous and appalled. How could he love such a monster? Yet he did. When blood formed dangerous, fetus pulls of her new organs, Nicholas disintegrated her, disanguished, disinguinated her. He washed the blood of the floor with a hose, spraying it into runoff channels, a brown sludge now created in her cephalic veins. A few days later, he cut out her fubius, a faded heart. It had no approval effect on her. Marissa, is a Marissa, made on inflated sounds, turning her head and back and forth as if strapped in a nightmare. Marcus discontinued in the morphine. She calmed, however, and he, when he approached, her head swirled and her body strained towards him as if she wanted him to comfort her. Nicholas pulled at his latex glove and stroked her straight forehead. She relaxed the dark arm pressed against his thigh. Though nobody else in the world could possibly have understood the mangled word. Nicholas did. His Marissa had called his name. Nicholas peeled off his gloves. He reached down and for the first time since he'd brought her here, touched her directly. Her skin was strippled in waxy bumps and felt cool beneath his fingertips. Yet in that moment he could not have loved her more. She stirred when he touched her prominence of her breasts. The nipples that had rotted and fallen off nearly a month ago. But the rest of the breasts had hardened to a shape that remained true 
to Marissa's. He stroked her the way she liked. Marissa groaned, arching against the restraints. Just as he had done so long ago, Nicholas feathered the back of his head down to her belly. He felt tiny invisible hairs rise to meet his knuckles. As soft as a breath, he slid. His hand slid between her legs, his long index finger strained into it. The moon neck of the swamps. A single drop of brownish fluid ran down his fingertip to his knuckle and fell on top of the table. Nicholas had an erection. She called out his name again. Climbing onto the gurney, Nicholas straddled Marissa. His head rose to me. Her head rose to meet his, her lipless mouth fitting precisely over his, and something pointing, pointed and greasy tore through his tongue like a rasp. He jerked his head back, tasting his own swelling blood, and something else too, a pang of loneliness, abandonment, and dark bra brackish coffee. The taste of cancer. He leaned forward to kiss her heart at this time, pressing his face against hers, his weight fully on her chest, her blistering breath forcing down his throat, straddling his acosius like bad scotch, unfurling in his lungs, settling contently there. He counted his lips on her. One minute, two minutes, almost three. Then pulled back, rasping for air, his heart hammered desperately, his vision blurred. Losing his balance, he toppled backwards off the gurney, fell over, felt ribs crack, then he hit something that jutted off the cold floor. Though we couldn't quite think what it might be, it didn't really bother him that much. Nicholas's limbs twitched uselessly as he convulsed, but bit by bit his body stilled as the cure to cold.